I can be nice. Hallelujah. I thank God for Bobby and Julia. I thank you for what God's done through their lives. I mean, I am rejoicing in what God has accomplished through this couple. And y'all have some precious people over you. Amen. They are the real deal. I know them for a long, long time. I don't know them intimately like you do day after day, week after week, but I know their hearts. And I wanted to share with you some things. God just changed my message right before I got to preach. Isn't that sad? Won't let you preach what you want. But uh, I want to just share some things with you today that I really believe are essential for church growth to continue. Y'all have had some extreme growth here, and that's unbelievable. Amen, what God's done in a short period of time. <clears throat> but for it to maintain growth, there has to be some elements. And I found that one of the elements in growth is enthusiasm. To be enthusiastic about the Lord about your pastor, about the church, about the members in the church. And then expectation. Coming to church believing that if you get someone to come, that there's an anointing here that can touch their life and set them free. So you have to have expectation. You've got to have enthusiasm. And then you have to have positive words. You've got to speak well of your church, of your pastors, of each other. Your words are so very powerful. They had a lie years ago when I was a kid. It said, sticks and stones will break your bones, but words won't hurt you. That's a lie straight from hell. Amen. Hit me with a stick, I'll heal. Speak something to my heart that will pierce it, and I'll be wounded for a long, long time. The Bible said a man of a wounded spirit is harder to be won than a walled city. And so I want to talk to you today about the tongue. Everybody say tongue. Put your finger in your mouth and see if you got one. Hey, I got one. Yeah. Okay. Do you know how forest fires are started? By a small match. And it burns hundreds of thousands of acres and homes and businesses and just destroys incredible amount of stuff. So the Bible <clears throat> has in James chapter 3, if you want to go there, people don't carry Bibles anymore. And also, look, I want to say something. These are the most expensive seats in the house. I just thought I'd say that. I don't know why. How many of y'all know when you go to a sports arena, the front row seats are the most expensive? People come to church, it seems, we're going to start charging more for those midway back. We're going to put a price tag on But I want you to go with me to James chapter 1, I mean 3. My wife, Jeanette, sends her greetings. We've been, we'll be married in 50 years in October. And uh, <clears throat> I know I got married young. Yeah. My mother's 93, and my wife is tending to my mom, so that's why she's not here. But let's look at James chapter 3, verse 1. My brethren, be not of many masters, knowing that we shall receive greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. So I just gave you the formula of being a perfect man, and being under control. We let our tongues lead us into destructive things. How many of y'all been married more than two days? All right, now y'all know what I'm talking about. So if you've been married more than two days, after you, <clears throat> when you first met your spouse, y'all talked on the phone? No? Y'all didn't say sweet things to each other? You didn't say, oh, I just can't wait to be with you forever. And you would call up, and they would answer the phone, and you'd say, oh, I'm just so glad you're there. And you would sit on the phone and breathe for hours. Talk about such wonderful things. And you want each other's hearts by speaking kind, edifying, uplifting words. And men, I want to give you a hint. Women love for you to tell them nice things. Look at all the women smiling. <laughs> I got all of y'all on my side. Now women, men like for you to admire them and, and esteem them as great men of God. And y'all did all those lies 
before you got married. You lied through your teeth. You told them things you really didn't believe. You really wanted to believe it. And they believed it, and so you got married. And then you went on your honeymoon. Wonderful. What a wonderful time. The two greatest weeks of my life was my honeymoon. Amen. Then we came home from our honeymoon, and we got home, we unpacked our suitcases, and two different people came out. Totally different people. And I want to know where she came from. So over 50 years, you learn to shut up. If you can bridle your tongue, you can be a perfect husband. Did you know that, man? And if you learn two statements, you can stay married for 50 years. I'm wrong, and I'm sorry. Please don't explain why you're wrong. Because <clears throat> women take that as a justification of why you just made an excuse why you were wrong. But the Bible is very clear here. It says, if you can bridle your tongue... You can be a perfect man. So I want you to begin to control and look at your tongue. But we have a problem. Everybody say, you have a problem. Yeah, I know. It's always the person next to you got the problem. He said, behold, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold, also ships, though they are, be great in size and are driven by fierce winds, yet they are turned they are turned about with a very small helm, whether so wherever the governor wants them to go. Even so, the tongue is a little member, and it boasts great things. See, that's what you did before you got married. You told them how great you are, and they believed you. But when you start living with a person, you begin to realize they're not everything they said. When I look for a worker and somebody comes to me and they tell me how many things they can do and they can do anything, I don't believe nothing they say. Because when a man's boasting about how great he is, he's usually not. So be careful what you're boasting. And then he says this, Behold how great a matter a little fire kindles. Even so the tongue is a little member and it boasts great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindles. The tongue is a fire. It is. It's a fire. And if you want to stir somebody up, start telling them about somebody that really hurt you. And give them all the details about the deep hurt. They won't even know the person, and before it's over, they're going to hate them. You're going to set a fire in that person's heart for someone they don't even know, and that fire is going to kindle in them, and every time they think of that person, they're going to hear all of your words. Stop that. Quit that. People who get married go run home to their parents and tell them all about the spouse that's not doing what they were supposed to do, and the parents get set on fire against that person, and then you go back and go in the bedroom and make up. And then the, pot, the mom and dad, they got this fire set inside of them, that when they see the person or think about the person, they only think about the bad things you said. Am I right? Okay, well, repent. Change it. Change it. Stop it. Stop that. It's destructive. You come to church and you might see somebody you love and somebody you like and somebody offends you and then you go home and you talk about the offended person. And you do it in front of your kids. And then your kids don't want to go to church, and you wonder why. You just poison them with your tongue. Speak well of each other. Prefer one another better than yourself, the Bible says. And consider their things more valuable than your own. So the Bible has a formula on how to control the tongue. Now, if y'all mad at me right now, it's because you're guilty. Okay, just tough. I didn't come here to make you happy. I came here to challenge your thinking to cause you to think different. Because if we don't change the way we think about something, we'll never change the way we act with it. And if you don't understand the danger of your tongue, you will use it in the wrong way. The Bible said a foolish woman tears down her own house with her own hands. It should say a foolish woman tears down her own house with her own tongue. And so does a foolish man tear down his wife with his own tongue. 
And so in a marriage is the closest relationship you're going to have. Church is intimate, but it's not as intimate as marriage. So you need to begin to work on your marriage. You don't have a problem with your spouse. You have a problem with the principles of marriage. Marriage is built upon conversation, communication, and edification. That's what the marriage is built on. And so if you want to build your marriage to a great marriage, start talking well of each other, even if you don't believe it. Amen. Children are molded by your words. Their potential is based upon what you tell them. A child who is spoken to in a negative way by a parent who he thinks is the ultimate authority because he doesn't know God yet, will form his whole life on your words to them. And so will your pastors, and so will the people in your church. And so will your community believe what you say about your church. So if you begin to go out in that community and speak well of your church, even if it's by faith, you want to see your church progress, you want to see your pastor be a stronger pastor, a better person, speak well of them, and you'll find that it will kindle a heartbeat to want to come. And so I want to encourage you today. Say, really, Brother Anthony? Yeah, yeah, I thought you would be nice. I am. I'm a nice guy. I don't know why people don't love me. It's amazing to me. Listen, y'all got to love me to get to heaven. It's in the Bible. Now, watch this. And the tongue is a fire. Say a fire. Say, I got a fire in my mouth. I'll burn you up in a second. A world of iniquity, a whole world of evil. It's in your mouth, a tongue among our members, that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. A tongue not controlled by the Spirit of God is a hellfire. A hellfire. It will not speak positive. Because it's selfish, self-centered, and wants its own way, and it wants everybody to submit to it. Say, how do you know that, Brother Anthony? (laughs) Because I was one of them guys who used my tongue to intimidate people. I've always had a gift to speak, and I would use that gift to cause you to bow down and humble yourself before me, and me get my way over you and dominate you. And then I got born again. Somebody say, hallelujah. I'm glad you saved too. We all need saving. Amen. Let me give you the definition of witchcraft. It is manipulation by intimidation in order for domination. And people use their mouths to manipulate, then intimidate so they can dominate. And churches are full of witchcraft today because their tongues are not under the control by the Spirit. And somewhere, your tongue has to fall under the authority of God. You cannot tame it. You can try. Have you ever tried to tame your tongue? I remember one day I was sitting at my dinner table with my kids, and we, we're Italian, so we all talk loud. You know what I mean? We, people come in my house and think we're arguing. Oh, no, we're just talking. This is not arguing. You ought to hear when it really gets arguing. It's arguing. This is talking. So we would sit at the table, and had a big old heavy oak table, and and Italians talk with their hands. So I said, you know what? I'm not going to get angry tonight when we start arguing. So I put my hands under the table, and it started. All of a sudden, the table started levitating. How many of y'all know you communicate with words, facial expressions, and hand actions, and body language? So you have to begin to control the body because the tongue is the key to that. And if you have that tongue under the authority of the Holy Spirit, you can be a perfect person. Isn't that amazing? Just one thing in your life, if you can bring it under the authority of a master, the Holy Ghost, you can become perfect in God. So you need to pay attention to that and you need to start yielding, say yielding. I need to yield my tongue, not try to control my tongue to the person who can control it. The Bible says when you don't know what to pray, pray in the Holy Ghost, for he will pray for you with groanings and utterings that you don't even understand, and he will make an intercession for you according to the will of God. So I can pray according to the will of God all the time if I pray in tongues. 
Now don't be upset. I'm telling you, your tongue is not your friend. Your brain is not your friend. The Bible says the natural mind is that intimacy with, intimacy with, intimacy with God. It is an enemy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Your natural mind will always go to logic and reasoning and get your tongue to agree with it and say things that are totally against the Word of God. Totally against Scripture. We say things all the time that are so unscriptural, amen, and we make them like it's, it's the gospel. Y'all paying attention, I can tell. He said every kind of beast and bird and serpent and things of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of de deadly poison. My God, it's like we're a bunch of snakes. That's what it's describing here. Remember, the devil used words to deceive Eve. You understand? To lure Eve and man willfully agreed. So words are powerful. I want you to know that every word that comes out of your mouth is eternal. Every word that comes out of your mouth is a seed. Every seed has a growth period. Every seed that finds fertile soil grows. And everyone that you speak to, if their heart is open to abusive words, that will grow in their heart. And you planted something in that person that will actually carry them into a lifestyle of abuse because now that seed is in them growing forth and producing fruit. And they themselves will repro re repeat the, re the abuse. Abuse people abuse people. Verbal abuse is the worst abuse you can give to a person. I want you to think about yourself. Because you are light. You are spirit. And your words are eternal. And God has given us a mouth to bless and not curse. To edify and not destroy. To strengthen and not weaken. Our mouths are to take words and put them in certain places in people's hearts that cause them to grow into another uh, edification of the Lord Jesus Christ. Building their faith by speaking to them, encouraging them, helping them, loving them, comforting them, edifying them. Somebody say amen. I, I got more time today. They cut me off at 10 o'clock, but I'll keep preaching today. If you get hungry, you got to take medicine, just go do it, and those who want to stay can stay. I won't be mad at you. Now watch what he says. But the tongue can no man tame. Say, I can't tame my tongue. And you definitely can't tame your spouse's tongue. Or your kids' tongue. Then he says this. Therewith we bless God, even the Father, and therewith we curse men, which are made after the similitude of God. Now I want you to realize something. When you speak negative against a Christian... You just spoke against Jesus. It's in the Bible. It said, when they've done it unto the least of these, my brethren, they did it to me. When Saul was persecuting Christians, the Lord struck him down on Damascus and caused him to go blind and said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And Saul says, Lord, who are you? He said, I'm Jesus. So we have to realize when we attack Anyone in the body of Christ, anyone, we are speaking against Jesus Christ. That's dangerous. Amen. You're speaking against the Lord himself. So the person next to you, if they're born again, they are a piece of the body of Christ. You can't speak about my nose and not speak about me. You can't speak about my son and not speak about me. Because I live in my son genetically. So when we begin to speak about, speak against the body of Christ, we speak against Christ and we speak against the Father. You need to learn how to say, you know what? They're not perfect, neither am I, but I'm going to bless them and I'm going to encourage them and I'm going to speak positive to them and I'm going to take them and edify them with my words. I'm going to let my words be fertilizer on the seeds that are sown in them. And I'm going to help them get to another level in Christ by blessing them and speaking the love of God to them. Come on, you can clap on that if you want to. He said, my brethren, these things ought not so to be that you bless men and curse.
bless God and curse men. It shouldn't be out like that. But a fountain sends forth, but does the fountain send forth the same place, sweet and bitter water? No. Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives and berries? Neither are vine figs. So can no fountain both yield salt, water, and fresh. Who is a wise man endued with knowledge among you? Who's wise? Anybody wise here? Let me see. Raise your hand. No? Okay, we've got one little boy. Yeah, I am. He said, I'm hearing you, Brother Anthony. I don't care what them grown up say. I'm wise. Now, the Bible says a lot of things about you. Here's what it says. You're holy, unrebukable, and unblameable in his sight. The Bible says you are kings and priests. The Bible said you are, you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. The Bible said you are perfect, entire, lacking nothing. Why don't we tell that? Why don't we say what God says? Why don't we say we're the apple of his eye? Why don't we say that we are his chosen people? We're called out of darkness into light. Why don't we say we are saved and filled with the spirit? Why don't we say we are healed and not sick? The devil wants you to take your tongue and come in agreement with his plan for your life. He wants you to come in agreement for his plan for your children. And his plan for your spouse. And his plan for the church. Don't ever come in agreement with the devil and what he says your children will be. I don't care where your children are. I don't care how far away from God they are. Don't you come in agreement with the devil that your children are going to wind up in hell. Don't you ever do that. My son was way out there, and every time I seen him, I said, Son, you're a covenant child. Do what you got to do. Go where you got to go. My God has his hand on top of you. You are covered with the blood. You have been dedicated to God. I don't care how far you run. God's with you. I'm not in agreement with what the devil has for your life. And when my son got saved, I said, son, when you was out there messing up, did God ever talk to you? He said, he never left me alone. I said, I knew that. I'm not in agreement with the devil for my wife. I'm not in agreement with the devil for my parents. I'm not in agreement with the devil for you. I'm in agreement with God for your life. That you are holy, unblameable, and unrebukable in his sight. I don't care what goes on. That's what God said about you. And so I'm going to tell you that. I'm going to encourage you. And I'm going to get you to stop using your tongue as an instrument of the devil. Whoever you yield your members to, to him you become a servant. Now I've been used of the devil many times by saying things. And it caused chaos and destruction. It caused hurt. It caused pain. It caused things that have not been undone even till today. You are sowing something that will bring forth a harvest, and that harvest will grow. And if that person doesn't learn to not accept what you told them as negative and change it by their own belief system, you have planted a seed that stays there for a long time. So look at somebody say, you're holy. Come on, look at them say that, you're holy. Yeah, you're holy. You're forgiven. No, oh, you're full of mercy and kindness. Why don't you speak nice to each other? Am I okay? I mean, y'all, y'all a nice group of people, but y'all up north. Look, where I live, if you don't understand it, I'll explain it to you. We live in St. Bernard Parish. We don't say the whole word because it takes too much breath. We explain that to you. And you ain't going to fugaboo God. No, you're not going to do that. Now watch this. He says, if you have, well, let me go back a little bit. Who is a wise man and a dude with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness and wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and strife in your hearts, remember this, out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. You got that? So if you want to know what's in your heart, the guy who invented the, the, the engine, the, the motor, the, you know, the steel block engine, there's an oil pan in there. But you are not Superman. You can't see through the block and see how much oil's in there. So he puts this incredible invention. He calls it a dipstick. It's got a long tube, and it's got a stick, and it goes down into the pan. You pull it out, and ladies don't know much about that. But you pull it out, and you look at it, and tell if you got oil in the car. Well, God gave you a dipstick. Your tongue is a dipstick to your heart. 
what's on your tongue is in your heart. And so when you speak, pay attention because what's in your heart's coming out of your tongue. And God says you want to have a good heart, a pure heart, a healthy heart. And he, this wisdom does not descend from above. It don't descend from above. What's that? Envy, strife in your heart. Have you ever been envious or strifeful or contentious? Yeah. We all have. Come on, we all have. We all want our way. We want it our way. Your name's not Frank Sinatra and this ain't Burger King. You can't have it your way. It's God's way. He said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. I am the way you're supposed to live. I am the truth. I'm telling you the truth. Now watch this, and it's really important. He said, this wisdom descends not from above, but it's earthly, sensual, and devilish. For envy and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. So when you get contentious and strifeful in your own home, you release into your home every evil work. You release it in your church. You release it on your job. You release it in your country. Are y'all uncomfortable? I hope so. We are loosing demonic spirits to carry out our negative words. I want you to understand, when you say something negative, demons are coming to carry it out. When you release positive words, God sends his angels to reinforce that and make that happen. So when you bless people, God sends his angels to bring that blessing to bring it to pass. When you curse people, the devil sends his spirits to bring out that curse. Now, how important are your words? Can somebody please evaluate this? How important is it when you speak to someone, that word coming out of your mouth, what is the eternal consequence of that word? Always consider what I say is eternal and is a seed and it will plant somewhere, and it will bring a harvest to somebody. Now, most children who wind up in prison, wind up in prison because of negative words spoken to them as children that they never did believe they could be successful, they never could please their parents, they never could accomplish what the parent wanted. I want to encourage you, speak positive to your children, encourage them, tell them what God wants them to be, and then stand alongside of them through their troubled times. They all go through it. They all go through difficulties. They all go through decisions that are not always the best for them. But you need to be there for them. And you need to have your arm and wrap around and hug them and tell them you love them. No matter where they go, you need to love them and embrace them. One of the things I do with my children, every time I speak to them, when I end the conversation, I say, I love you. I want them to hear that word come out of my mouth in case I never see them again. I want them to know the last thing my daddy told me before he left this planet was that he loved me. That word love has an empowering effect on people's lives. If you have a struggle with someone, start saying, I love this person. I love you. When you see him, say, I love you. You say, well, I don't feel like I love him. Love is not a feeling. <laughs> it's a decision. And when you can make the right decision in spite of your feelings, you have crossed over the animalistic part of your life and you start walking like sons and daughters of God. When you can begin to look at your circumstances and in spite of all that, speak the word of God, the truth, then you have crossed over from being under the control of your emotions and now being in control by the Spirit of God. When you can look at a husband who is not being what he's supposed to be, or a wife who's not being what she's supposed to be, and you can start speaking life to them and start telling them, I bless you, and I love you, and I cherish you, and you're valuable to me. All of a sudden, that person starts coming up to that standard that you set for them. Amen. When I do marriage counseling, I got two items, and I told Bobby to go buy a bunch of them. I buy little mirrors. And I buy a lot of duct tape. And I give everybody in that marriage counseling a mirror. I give one to the husband. I give one to the wife. I say, no, look in that mirror. Don't look in her mirror. Look in your mirror. And when they look in the mirror, I said, guess what? You just found a problem in your marriage. 
Now take the duct tape and fix it. Shut up. Words. <laughs> Some of y'all got that. Some of y'all is... These northern people, they, they got education. Anyway. When I begin to learn to shut up, when things get heated, I win. And the Holy Ghost is able to minister to my wife if I shut up. If I don't shut up, we in trouble. Amen? And when she shuts up, the Holy Ghost jumps on me, and I'm in trouble. So if you want to win the battle, shut up. And pray in tongues. And let the Holy Ghost move upon your spouse, because nobody can change their heart but him. Have y'all found that out? You can't change nobody? God gave me this vision one day. He said, Anthony, if you try to change your wife, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to fold my arms. And when all your teeth fall out, and your hair is totally gray, and your chest falls down into your lower part of your body, and you get weak, I'll still be there with my arms folded, because you want to be God. Now, if you shut up, I'll do my work. And I'll, I'll work on them when you're not looking and when you're not hearing them. I'll work on them. But if you try to change them, go ahead. How many of y'all are guilty? There you go. I'm, I knew I had the right message for this church today. Now, watch this. This is really important. He said, but the wisdom that is from above, say above, now, you don't want to suck your feelings from hell. You want to receive your feelings from heaven, right? So the wisdom that's from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle. Oh, my goodness. Easy to be entreated. Full of mercy and good fruit, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. So how many of y'all want to be wise people? Well, you just got a formula that when you become divisive, it's not from God. When you try to prove you're right, it's not from God. When you're trying to make the point, it's not from God. God's peace is peaceable and gentle and easy to be entreated. It's merciful. It's long-suffering. It's the fruit of the Spirit. So here's what happened. God created man, and they all had one language. Say one language. It's not like it is today. You go around where you've got to have interpreters. One language, and they all decided to build a tower to heaven to accomplish what they wanted. Well, God came down, and he saw that, and he said, you know what? These people can do whatever they decide to do because of their one language. So I'm going to do something. I'm going to confuse their languages so they can't communicate. And he did, and they scattered throughout the whole world, and that's how you got all the nationalities and all the languages right from there. It's called the Tower of Babel. So then when God wants to bring the language back to one language, he uses the same principle, but now he pours out his Holy Spirit and they speak in new tongues. Now the Bible said your tongue is a fire set on fire by hell, but on Pentecost he had cloven tongues of fire to give you a new tongue of fire, the fire of the kingdom of God that can burn up your enemy, not your friends. Your enemy is the devil. Everybody say, I got one enemy. My husband is not it. My wife is not it. My kids are not it. My past ain't it. The president ain't it. The past president ain't it. The devil's it. We used to play a game when we was kids. Not it. Go run to the devil and say, not it. I'm not it no more. You are. Focus on destroying the works of the devil with your mouth by praise. If you want to defeat the devil, you come into his courts with thanksgiving and with praise. The devil can't fight that. Amen. When God got ready to destroy the walls of Jericho, he gave him a plan. Now, you know, this didn't come out of a committee of people. I want you all to walk around that wall seven times and on the seventh time shout and it's going to fall down. How many of y'all know we had never got that out of committee? And then he said, don't say nothing. You know why he told him not to say nothing? Because he knows how we are. Here's those guys walking around the wall. Man, that's a big wall, yeah. Man, you know how thick that wall is? You know how thick it is? 
I mean, he's thick. Yeah. Look at them people up there. Look how big they are. Look how little we are. They, they would have walked around and they'd have complained and moaned and groaned until they all got discouraged and quit. When Abraham got ready to take Isaac to kill him, he didn't wake his wife up and tell her nothing. There's some things the woman don't need to know when you're ready to kill a kid. <laughs> Could you imagine waking up Sarah? Hey, baby, today I'm going to go kill your kid. That woman would have scratched his eyeballs out. Amen. Abraham would have been, it would have been a thought process of what should have happened. So God doesn't let us say everything we want to say. He doesn't want us to tell everything we know. God wants us to keep quiet and listen. A wise man is a man of few words. A fool utters all of his heart. Anybody been foolish but me? I told this this morning. I was, my wife and I, we married 50 years. So we've had a lot of arguments over 50 years. Come on. Come on. If we had one a year, that means we had 50. We had two a year, it's a hundred. We had five a year. Oh, it gets crazy. And we've had more than five a year. So we, you know, I want to let you know. We've had difficulties as a married couple and have had to learn what I'm teaching. And so one day we got in this argument and she was in the kitchen and I felt my anger coming from hell. No, you understand? It was, I felt it coming out the concrete. And it got about right here and I knew it was fixing to hit my heart. And I was fixing to gush it. So I walked out the house. Ladies, I want to give you a hint. When the man you married to walks out, let him go. Do not jump in front of him and say, I am not finished. You are not leaving. He's already at his limit, lady. He knows he's fixing to blow you away with fire. So he's trying to get out the house and cool down. So I went outside in the garage. Oh, y'all laughing. Like, y'all know exactly what I'm talking about. I went in the garage, and I got outside, and I started praying, God, help me, help me, help me, God, help me, God. I'm wrong, I know I'm wrong. He said, Anthony, shut up and don't say another word. I'm already ministering to your wife. So I should have stayed outside about 10 more minutes and prayed in tongues for 10 more minutes. But I immediately went back to the house, and, you know, it was amazing. <clears throat> when I opened that door... My heart must have filled up while I was outside. And everything I wanted to say before I left that I didn't say because I knew I shouldn't have said it, I went, yeah! And my, and, and, and my wife went, Wah! And, and it's like I had gasoline and threw it onto a fire thinking I was going to put it out. <laughs> Woof! Eyebrows were gone. Hair was gone. Singed. And I walked outside and I said, God? He said, I told you. Don't say nothing. How many of y'all know sometimes you got to be quiet until God takes control? How many of y'all, once you get chemically induced by those endorphins and those other chemicals that get produced when you get angry, it's 30 minutes before your brain becomes normal? That's true. That's scientific. We get juiced up on chemicals, not drugs, but our own drugs. And then we don't calm down takes a while. So I would be the type of person, being Italian, we're very emotional, and I would get angry, and my wife would be hammering me, and she would prove me wrong. Have you ever had your wife just prove you wrong? I mean, she hit me with so many facts, I'm really, you know, I am wrong. But I'm mad, because I'm wrong. And so I would say to her, okay, I'm sorry, forgive me. She said, you don't sound like you're sorry. And I would say, it's the best I can do because I'm still mad. But I'm wrong. I realize it. Somebody help me. Now, if two people who really love each other, who bore children together, who have grandchildren together, who have lived in the same house and worked together and went on a mission field together and left a business and a big home to go serve God, have these problems, I know you have them. I know it. And I'm trying to help you pay attention what fire is using your tongue. 
there is a fire burning in you. And that fire will either be from heaven or hell. And so God sent us the Holy Ghost and he poured out his Holy Spirit and he began to tame the untamable member of your body, which is your tongue. You cannot tame it, but you can yield it. And when you yield it in prayer to the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will use your tongue to glorify God and to edify one another. I pray in tongues a lot. You know why? Because I know without the Spirit, I am a man out of control. I understand my weakness. And I use the instruments of God to strengthen me. The Bible says to build yourself up upon your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, Jude verse 20. Build yourselves up upon your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. So when I begin to read that and understand what God wants me to do is to kick out the natural thinking. Because remember, tongues is foolishness. But God takes foolish things and confounds wise people. So I don't understand what I'm saying when I speak in tongues, but I know it's the Spirit of God in me, and it encourages me to know that He's still there. So I pray in tongues while I'm driving. I pray in tongues while I'm cutting grass. I pray in tongues while I'm in church. I pray in tongues when I'm in the bedroom. I pray in tongues all the time as much as I can. And I find that I get stronger and stronger in spirit. And my spiritual man is at a gym all the time. I know y'all say, Brother Anthony, you ought to get your physical guy over there too. And you're right. But my spiritual man, I keep him in the gym of Holy Ghost. And when I begin to pray in the Spirit, something happens inside of me that I have an assurance that he's with me. The Bible says his spirit bears witness with my spirit that I'm a son of God. So here's what happens. I get edified in my spirit man and I have an assurance I'm a Christian. And so if I'm a Christian, I can live like one. You hear me? I told one man he was living in adultery and he said, I'm a Christian. I said, either change your name or change what you're doing, but the two don't go together. The Bible says God won't, Christ won't be one with a fornicator. I said, either change your name, deny your Christianity, and you can stay here or quit your adultery. One or two. We have to be Christians, folks. Do you understand what that means? Christ-like. So you are representing Jesus. You cannot represent or represent Jesus without his spirit. You can't do that. You cannot represent the kingdom of God with another spirit from another kingdom. Remember this, there's two kingdoms, the kingdom of Satan and the kingdom of God. And you're living in one of those two all the time. And the Bible says we go in and out. We do. We go in the presence of God and out of the presence of God. And we find pleasure in this life too. So you have to be careful when you come out of the presence of God that you're filled from within. That you're not only there in physical, but you're there in spirit. And the spirit of God leads you in all truth. All truth. The Bible said if you are led of the spirit, you shall not satisfy the lust of your flesh. So there's two things you have to control. One, the lust of your flesh, and you do that by walking in the Spirit. Two is your tongue, and you do that by yielding it to the Spirit. And when you begin to speak truth with love to people, they begin to be drawn to you. And that's what builds churches. That's what builds churches. Not buildings, not great pastors, which all of those are contributing. But what builds churches is you always are ready to give a hope, an answer for the hope that's in you that people see something in you that they want because this pastor don't get to see everybody, but you do. You see circles of people that he will never meet. Those people hear words coming out of your mouth that are edifying. They hear joy. They hear peace, fruits of the Spirit. They're going to want that, church. They want that. The world wants that. The world needs that. The world wants to be loved. The world wants to be accepted. The world wants to be forgiven, just like you and me. And if you have the right spirit, you're going to always be open to people 
And if they hurt you, you're just going to forgive them. You're just going to forgive them. Forgiveness is a choice. A choice of the spirit, not of the mind. Love is a choice of the spirit, not of the mind. And we need to be spirit-led, not mind-led. We are people who are mind-led most of the time and spirit-led some of the time. It needs to be reversed. We need to be spirit-led most of the time or all the time and mind-led no time. God loves you. God brought you here today for a specific reason. Matter of fact, I had a word in the worship. He said, I brought you here to set you free. That was a word for you. I brought you here to set you free from hate, from hate, hurt, rejection, and wounded spirit. And wounded spirit. Now, if you want to be free, you can. Or you can sit there and maintain your pride, which is of the devil, or you can be free. It's your choice today to be free. I came here <clears throat> totally led of the Spirit to be here. I called Pastor Bobby. I have never, I don't ask anybody for meetings. God told me not to do that. But this is a son. And at times I feel like I need to tell my son certain things. And I felt led to call Bobby and say, Bobby, I want you to know I'm available. I got a message for your church. You tell me when to come, I'll come. And sure enough, he gave me a date and it was open. I knew that was God. And I believe I'm here under the divine authority of God, speaking to you in the love of God about this dangerous thing that all of us have within us it's called our tongues. And if you don't control it, it's destructive. It's destructive. I have learned to tell people I love them. That was not easy for an Italian, seriously. But I've learned to just tell people I love them. Matter of fact, I tell real strong men I love you and they get uncomfortable. I'm not homosexual, I'm a Christian. And the love of God is the signature of a Christian. Loving people is a signature of the love of God being in you. And here's what the Lord told me and I'll close with this. He said, Anthony, if a person cannot love, they don't believe they're loved. And if a person can't forgive, they don't believe they've been forgiven. I had a young lady come today after the first service and told me she was going through some things. And I said, listen, God forgave you of a lifetime. You need to forgive. And it's a choice. Amen. It's not a feeling. It's a choice. And love is a choice. And I can love you. Before I drove here, I said, Lord, I'm going to love those people in Leesville. Whether they accept the message or reject the message, whether they get up and walk out or they don't get up and walk out, I've made a decision. I'm going to love you. And I'm going to forgive you, no matter how you treat me. I don't wait to be treated a certain way to choose to forgive. I choose to forgive before I'm treated. You understand that? And so many people have been hurt for so long <clears throat> that that wound is so deep. That's why the Bible says, take the shield of faith and quench the fiery darts. The fiery darts are words that are being spoken to you. You need to quench them. And when I begin to walk in the spirit and begin to realize how wonderful it is to love people, I begin to do something that I never did before because I was taught in the ministry, you don't hug women, you don't hug men, you know, you don't, you don't hug. Well, God started telling me to hug people. And I was in Russia the first time it happened. I was in um, Kavrov where Brother Alexander was. And I'll never forget this because it was so powerful. <clears throat> they had an old man, a real old man, old Russian man came up. He had real normal old clothes. They had an old woman dressed like an old babushka. They had a beautiful young lady in a black dress and they had a young guy in a very expensive suit. And all four people came to the altar. And the Holy Spirit said, hug him. And I thought, well, I'm going to start with the old man because I don't want people to think I'm hugging this pretty girl. That's all. You know, I mean, you're mine. I went over and I grabbed the old man and I hugged him. He began, I began to feel the love of, this is true. I felt the love of God coming out of my chest into him. And it was like a river. It started flowing. And, went, and he fell on the ground, shaking and trembling. So I walked over to the old lady and I hugged her. 
Same exact thing happened. She fell to the ground, <clears throat> and she started shaking and just weeping. Both of them were weeping. So I walked over to the young man. I said, if this dude falls in this expensive suit on this dirty floor, this is God. Ser I'm serious. I hugged him. He hit the floor. Bam! Weeping and crying. So I hugged the young girl. Bam! She hit the ground in that beautiful dress. All four of them on the floor, weeping and crying because they experienced the love of God. You have that love in you. You got to learn to release it. Amen. By reaching out, laying hands on people, touching them. We got to get back to relationships. Church is not an organization. It's an organism of Christ. And Christ touched people. Christ loved people. Christ helped people. He went about doing good. You and I need to go about doing good. Amen. We've done bad long enough. I think the end of that ought to happen. And that we need to speak positive, not negative. We need to encourage, not discourage. We need to be builders, not tear us down. We need to be a people of this city that when they talk about this church, Christian living, they believe you're a Christian living it. Let's live up to the name on the front of this building. Let's live like Christians. Let's live like the Christ-like people we are. Let's be motivated from within, not from without. You don't need a motivational speaker you need a motor inside of you called the Holy Ghost, called the dynamo of God, the love of God, the power of God, the peace of God, the joy of God, the presence of God. And the more you pray in the Spirit, the more peace you have on the inside because you have something that you know is real. Amen? Now I want you just to bow your heads with me. Father, I thank you for your Holy Ghost. Holy Spirit, we invite you here today. We invite your presence and your power. We invite your peace and your joy. You said the kingdom of God is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. So, Father, I want you to know that we want that. We want that peace and that joy that comes out of our relationship with you and each other. So, Holy Spirit, I ask you now to fill your people. If you have a prayer language, I want you just to let the Holy Ghost just start flowing through you right now. You don't have to pray loud, loud, but you, I want you to pray. And I want you to let the Holy Spirit just flow through you right now. Just begin to pray. Let it flow out of you right now. Just yield to the Holy Spirit. And let Him begin to fill you from inside out. Let Him begin to take charge of your heart. And let Him fill your heart with the peace of the joy of the kingdom. Allow the Holy Spirit control over your tongue. When God sent the baptism of the Holy Ghost and the cloven tongues of fire set on those, it was a brand new fire. This fire wasn't going to consume other people. This fire was going to consume all the negative within them. It was going to purify them from within to cause them to walk in a new way without. They became so bold and so confident in the presence of God in their life that those who once ran from Jesus and his crucifixion now ran to the streets to be crucified. There was something so different about them after the baptism that they were no longer afraid to die. They were no longer ashamed of Christ. They were no longer of themselves. Now their whole life was dedicated to helping others and to devoting their life to causing people to come to Christ. They quit being selfish and self-centered. They began to become selfless and willing to suffer whatever it took to bring the message to someone else's life. That's what this church needs. That's what this community needs. So I want you to just allow the Holy Spirit to continually fill you every day of your life. And if you've never been filled with the Holy Ghost, we want to give you an opportunity to have that happen today. That's your choice. But if you yield to the Holy Spirit and yield that unruly member in your body, your tongue, to Him, He will come and He will fill you and He will worship the Father through you. So just let Him have His way. It's about yielding to Him. So I'm going to give it to Brother Bobby now. Let him begin to minister to you the way he feels the Lord wants. Thank you, Jesus. 
just bow your heads right now and just stay in prayer for just a moment. We're almost done, so we're going to release you just in a second. Thank you, Father. You know, a message like this covers a multitude of situations. It can go from A to Z in our life. I don't know where this message ministers to you at. Only you do. But I want to have the moment and opportunity just to take it and come in agreement with you and pray with you in that special way. Heads bowed, eyes closed. If you say, Pastor, this message ministered to me in an area of my life that I need prayer. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to make you stand. I just want to come in agreement with you. If this message, message ministered to you in a certain way, it's an area that you say, Pastor, come in agreement with me and pray. Just raise your hand. If that's you this morning, just right where you're at. Just raise your hand. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Anyone else? Just raise your hand. You can raise it up. Thank you, Jesus. Father, I thank you right now for the many hands all over this sanctuary. God, you have touched us all in a special way. Father, when we're dealing with a multitude of people, there's so many different situations, circumstances. Father, it's always amazing how when the man of God speaks, those to the left receive something different from those to the right, but it's the same Holy Spirit. So, God, we thank you right now in advance for what you're about to do. Every hand that was lifted says they need that, whatever that may be in their life. Holy Spirit, we just release you to do what you were called to do for such a day as this. You know every marriage, every relationship, every circumstance, every situation. And Father, we rejoice together with brothers and sisters because of what you have done and what you continually are going to do. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Maybe you showed up today. I never want to miss an opportunity for salvation. Maybe you showed up today and you might even simply say, Pastor... I've never been saved. I've never accepted Christ in my life. Or, Pastor, I'm here this morning, but I realize today that I have been backsliding. I have backslid. I have just ran from God, and I want to get that right today also. Listen, from the heart, between you and the Father, right there at your seat, just begin to pray, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Jesus, come into my life today. Jesus, I repent. Jesus, I make you my Lord and my Savior, my Master and my King. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Thank you, Jesus, for redeeming me. Heads bowed, eyes closed. If that's you this morning, I just want to pray with you. Again, I'm not going to embarrass you or call you out. just want to come in agreement with you this morning. If that's you, right where you at, just raise your hand. If you Ask Jesus. Amen. Amen. Anybody else? Amen. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Hands all over. Thank you, Jesus. God, you are a redeeming God. You are a loving God. You are a graceful God. And God, I thank you for your grace, your salvation. And God, I pray right now that every hand that was lifted, God, if this is not their home church, they'll find a place to get plugged in. They'll find a place where the gospel is being preached, not compromised. And God, I thank you right now that you're going to touch them, restore them, redeem them. And God, I pray they become stronger today than ever before. We honor you this morning with all that you've done and all that you are capable and going to do. In Jesus' powerful name, amen and amen. If you receive this word this morning, just give God a hand, amen. God is good, amen. I want to encourage you also, Brother Anthony is going to be standing over here by the piano, and if you need some personal one-on-one -on -one ministry, he wants to take the opportunity to pray with you, encourage you, and so 
Don't leave. If you want to get pray, prayed for or whatever, he's going to be right over here to do that. Also, right after the service, if you want to be part of the Incredible, please sign up in the back.